Hi. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah? Is this better? Or you got my mic? You hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm Katie Linden. I'm Vice President at Area Code Games. We've been making real world games uh, since 2005. And I'm going to talk to you today about the first 10 years of locative gaming. So locative gaming brings together two things, location and, and games. And in terms of location, sometimes we just think of that as GPS. Obviously, here there's um, more interesting ways of thinking about what location is. But for games, you can think of it, it could be sight, it could be sound, it could be sonar, it could be uh, triangulation, it could be sensor data. It's important to think about that range of, of, of input. And when we think about games, we talk about them as stylized systems of social interaction. So it's the intersection of these two bodies. Um, I think in terms of location, it's interesting to think about 1990 Navstar satellite system GPS being launched and the two different types of GPS that, that you had. There was you know, the more precise PPS that was available for the military and then the civilian, the SPS, which was less, uh, less precise. Um, but GPS obviously was a huge game changer in, in many ways. Um, in, in May of 2001, President Clinton turned off uh, the selective uh, uh, availability function so that this precision was then available to civilians and commercial use. And that, in a way, transformed and opened up, if you will, the game board to being the world um, and allowed for some precision within that space. A few days later, the first geocache was placed. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with geocaching. It's been around since 2000, um, and it follows in the tradition of letterboxing um, from England. A few days after it was placed, it was already logged, and people had found it, and, um, and, and that game was off and running. Um, G in 2004, GPS availability, uh, it, it, legislation was passed so that it could be turned off on demand by President uh, George W. Bush. And, and that's fine for game designers because, like I said before, we're looking at location um, and the range of how you're getting location from a variety of different sources. So, but it reinforces designing around the availability of location data. All right, so if we're talking about games and designing games for location, there's some key things that we need to play. We need to avoid the empty room problem, which is critical mass. Nobody likes showing up to a party or a game where you're the only person there. It sucks and it's lonely. Um, so we need to get people together, and that has uh, uh, implications based on temporality, time. You need to, if you're playing a synchronous game where you're together at the same time, you need to be there together at the same time. It has issues uh, with space, or it might be uh, networked. Uh, what else do we need? We need access to play. So if, you know, if, we're, if we're using technology and platforms, we may need access to mobile phones, or we may need access to GPS or 3G. Um, there's a range of, of different services that we, and, and hardware and software that we might need, need to have um, uniformly to be able to uh, have that player base. And then we need those shared social spaces. And this was a non-trivial problem, especially in 2000, that radically changed over the past decade with the rise of Facebook and Twitter, um, where, where we already have a kind of massive asynchronous and synchronous uh, social graph that are, that are people you want to play with. OK, so let's talk about the ghosts of gaming past, present, and future. Um, in 1973, there was an interesting kind of precursor to alternate reality games called The Game that started in L.A., and this has continued over time. Um, in New York, we call it Midnight Madness, and it's kind of a game that turns a city into a game board, and these are usually puzzle-based, location-based uh, uh, location uh, uh, games that you're playing over, over the course of a night, for example. And they're not massive in terms of the number of people that are playing it, but they're massive in terms of the fanaticism that people play it with. Likewise, in the 60s, we saw Assassins, which has made its way onto um, Facebook in a massive way. And this is a kind of tag that's dressed up with, you know, you're killing other people and you might be on different, uh, different teams. OK, so like I said, in uh, 2000, geocaching kind of kicked it all off. This is important in terms of pervasive play. So you'll hear me talk about uh, event-based or pervasive play. These are different play patterns. Um, pervasive is something that's happening on an ongoing basis. You might be doing this every day, you might be doing this once a month, but it's a game that's kind of running in the back of your head. The real world is alive with this play all the time. 
versus event-based where you know, it might be a fixed period of time that you're playing. So what's interesting about geocaching, where you're basically placing objects in the real world and then posting those uh, GPS uh, coordinates online for other people to find, what's interesting is that um, you're basically curating experiences for people. You're bringing people to different places around the world that they may not otherwise have gone to. Um, and that's, that's been pretty interesting, I think, for folks. Okay, this is a very early uh, 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 location-based mobile phone game. This is Bot Fighters that was available in Europe in 2001. It used uh, cell triangulation for location, and their, their claim to fame was that they could cause an adrenaline rush by having a player send a text message, because that's the way you would shoot an opponent. Um, and and, and non-trivial problems that they're trying to solve here, again, if you think about the empty room problem, who's playing this game um, at the same time with you? Are there enough uh, opponents that you have in your space that there's a reason for you to shoot people? How do you get other people, your friends, to play with you? These are the kinds of things that are important when you think about you know, real-world gaming and location-based gaming. At the same time, um, Blast Theory, which is an art uh, an arts group is, is, is launching Can You See Me Now? This is a, an event-based game that's being played at museums and art centers. What's interesting here is that you have players who are on the street with a, a device that is, is tied to the environment, and they're playing along with a group of players who are online. So you have real-world players playing with online players um, and, and kind of navigating a real-world game. And we see this kind of come back and rear its head again over the course of the next few years. In 2003, the big urban game was designed um, and implemented in uh, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. This was done to kind of build uh, engagement in the city. It was done by the university, by the design center. And the way that the, the, there were three teams, blue, red, and yellow, and the way that they, uh, you could make a move in the game was by calling a 1-800 number or, um, or, or voting on a website or participating by helping to move your actual piece around the city. And it, it was pretty um, spectacular, which uh, event-based, spectacular, and really kind of catalyzed the community around this, this idea of turning city into game board. Um, Dennis Crowley of Foursquare fame here in Pac Manhattan. This is the idea of liberating the iconic um, uh, video game of Pac Man and placing it on the streets of New York City. So, uh, GPS wasn't working at this point. This wasn't using GPS. This is uh, using a similar model to Can You See Me Now? You have you know, a Pac Man character, some ghosts running around on the street. They've got their cell phones, and then you have some controllers up in a room who have the map and they're telling them where to go. And, um, became a phenomenon and was played you know, all around the world. Uh, next year, Conquest. This is uh, the first kind of commercial application of location-based games. Uh, this was done for Quest Wireless, and it turned multiple cities into game boards. This was for high school students, and it got them using their cell phones to unlock uh, treasure in different territories. So they're running around the streets with these pre-programmed phone cams. Again, this is 2005. And taking pictures of semicode, this is the first use of, of 2D barcodes for location um, information and, uh, in North America. And, and it became a phenomenon and, and a kind of annual event and the obligatory 25-foot high totem animals that were being moved around the city. Um, okay. Payphone Warriors, this is 2006. Uh, they're using an almost obsolete uh, technology that we have around us, which is public payphones as location. So basically, you're capturing territory in the real world by calling in from a number that's recognized as a specific location. Uh, this is event-based, um, not pervasive. And, uh, and these kinds of games are growing so much that in 2006, you have the first Come Out and Play Festival, which is a festival solely dedicated to games that turn cities and location and real world into, into games. Um, Crossroads was designed for that first Come Out and Play Festival. This is a two-player mobile strategy street game that used GPS uh, on Boost Mobile phones. And this was actually designed for a particular grid of streets in Manhattan on the West Village. And the reason is because they have very, they're very low. You know, one of the problems you have with GPS is canyon effect. And so that was the workaround for, for this scenario. So basically, there's two players. You're the sun or the moon. You're capturing intersections. And then you're also you know, being uh, afraid of this agent of chaos that's chasing you down the street, which is an invisible um, member of the game. 
Uh, in, in 2006 and 2007, Plunder is a location game for laptops and computers. So it's using WPS. This was working with Skyhook, um, the guys who were responsible for location on your iPhones. Um, basically, it geolocated your computer, and it's a Dope Wars style game. So if anybody had uh, the, the Palm Pilot, and this was the, the biggest download on the Palm Pilot, Dope Wars, where you were buying and selling drugs in different parts of cities. So this is a similar, similar application, but using um, pirates and the idea of trading spices and other sorts of goods. In 2007, uh, Shark Runners is a, a real world game that's, that's taking a very different approach. So in this game, you are playing a virtual marine biologist and you're setting a course for your virtual boat. And you can see it takes a long time. That's like a seven hour course because this is a, a real one-to-one uh, -one mapping of, of you know, the actual ocean here. Um, and you see there's sharks there. Your goal is to kind of intercept with those sharks so that you can collect data on them. Um, but because it's such a slow game, you're not sitting there and watching it. It's light, it's pervasive. This is coming back to that idea of pervasive, persistent play. You log in in the morning, set a course for your boat, walk away from the game. When your boat intercepts with a shark, we'll send you a text message or an email, and then you can come back in and collect data on it. <clears throat> the interesting thing in the connect connection to the real world here is that the data for the location of the sharks is actually tied to real world sharks that have satellite and pop-off tags attached to their dorsal fins. So you're in a sense playing a game of tag with real world sharks. Um, Following that, in 2008, this is uh, kind of moving into more mainstream. This is a uh, Inoshima treasure hunt that was done for the Nintendo DS. This is event-based. You could play this game by signing up to go to this island off of Tokyo. And um, it's, it's using your, your Nintendo DS. It's a location game. So you're walking around this island and kind of dis discovering treasure. Um, now, 2008, so we have the iPhone. Again, when we were talking about access before, this is radical transformation. Also, Facebook and Twitter, much more, you know, have such an incredible presence at this point. So what that, what that does is it, it gives more people the opportunity to play in the same space together. So this is Parallel Kingdom, which is a location-based, massively multiplayer mobile game. Um, and the idea, if, if you're familiar with World of Warcraft, is kind of take that model and slap it on top of Google Maps. Um, and, and, and play it out in the real world. Again, non-trivial problems when you think of the issue of the empty room. I think they've done a lot to design for single player experiences here because you know what happens if I'm the only person with this in Spokane, Washington and I wanna play it with my friends but nobody else has it. Um, I think there's, there's some interesting innovation to take place over there. Okay, 2009, we see kind of the rise of social mobile services that have achievements on top of them and gaming mechanics. So, so <clears throat> services like Foursquare and Goala, where what's happening here is, is people are being incentivized by gaming mechanics to go to different places, to have new strategies and new tactics for exploring the world around them. And it's all wrapped up in a social space so that there's reputation and there's meaning for the choices that you're having. Again, this is pervasive, so this is ongoing. It's the idea that games are, you know, these location-based games are no longer relegated to specific event-based experiences. They're integrated. My Town, if you heard the talk yesterday, this is a pervasive, simple gaming where um, it's, it's kind of, it's social gaming and it's using some of the play patterns from, from Farmville, but it's, it's in a kind of monopoly framing where you're going to, going to locations and kind of buying and selling real estate. And the idea being that um, it seems to me like a confluence of adver gaming and, and location. Um, I want to run through this because I'm running out of time. Code of Everin, I think, is, is an, a unique example. This is a massively multiplayer online game for 9 to 13-year-old children. It is um, commissioned by the United Kingdom government to teach children how to cross the street safely. So the idea here is how can real world and locative gaming affect your behavior outside of the game once you've played something. So in this game, uh, kids are going through a behavior loop over and over again where they need to practice uh, road safety, good road safety habits, and they're rewarded. The thing is, is that these crazy monsters that you see here are actually controlled by traffic data from the real world in the UK. So that's affecting, you know, based on time of day and day of week, the, the type, the frequency of monsters and the, the type of dangers that are there. 
Um, internet eyes in terms of behavior modification and, and real world and locative gaming is interesting. This is taking all the CCTV footage from the UK, which is massive, and basically crowdsourcing it, incentivizing EU citizens to go through that footage, putting them on a leaderboard, and even paying them money for identifying fellow citizens who have broken the law. Um, interesting to think about that kind of real world locative gaming and what happens after the fact, how that might have implications to behavior. Um, Pokewalker, this is a kind of add-on for a Pokemon title, and this is a, a pedometer. It kind of harkens back to Julian Bleeker and the Near Future Labs flavonoids, if you saw those earlier in, in around 2007. Um, this is taking your physical activity and integrating it back into uh, a DS game. We saw the Parrot AR uh, uh, demo yesterday, and, and, and this is Avatar Machine. I think what's interesting with these projects, and especially with... Um, with you know, the iPad coming out to think about is when we start to get used to experiencing places and spaces in the real world through a camera and through overlays on, on, on top of that, how does that change our relationship to the real world and to space? How is that going to begin to alter the way that we relate to the real world around us? Um, Quickly, this is a, a kind of unprecedented effort in four different American cities where it's, it's really about designing for hyper-localization. So a lot of the things we looked at in particular are platforms that are meant to be played you know, all over. Um, these are games that are designed for specific communities for local issues that, that other games may not speak to. So these are issues like disaster preparedness in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, rural and urban planning in Charlotte, North Carolina, neighborhood abandonment in Detroit, these types of things. How can you design games, location-specific games, to really speak to those communities? And I think you know, some, some key things to think about in terms of the future, augmented social realities, hyper-localization, again, what happens when we start thinking about and honing in on design uh, solutions for particularly local problems or issues, tying physical activity to location, how can we begin to really grow and learn from what we can do with that, and increased role of real-world data integration and feedback. Thanks so much. Thank you.